sound check. All right. Um, well, I think then we'll get started. I am so thankful and grateful to be here at the Yuma Garden Summit today. Um, this is a very special, beautiful day. I know that we're very fortunate here in Arizona to be able to be gardeners in the month of January and to kick off our year uh, with the seasons just welcoming us into the coming spring, which will bring warmth, which will just benefit the plants and the flowers and all of the life around us. And I first want to start by acknowledging Yuma, the land of Yuma. I have a lot of love for Yuma. I've been to Yuma and I am just, you know, it's so awesome that you guys are out here gathering here today. Uh, I, I know um, <clears throat> I had heard of Yuma for a long time, but I really had my perspective change when one of my friends who is a Peeposh person, which is of the Maricopa tribe, uh, shared to me that Yuma is known as the place where waters meet. And we know in Arizona that all rivers flow to the Colorado and uh, Yuma is is that is that convergence of the waters. And so, you know, if I was to get to Yuma many years ago before there were highways, I could probably do so by running along the Gila River. And so while the waters, you know, uh, the waters really connect us and the entire Colorado River watershed actually is coming together where you are. So you're really in a very special place to be gardening. You're in a place where, you know, gardening has been happening for generations upon generations, really for millennia. Um, and in, in Yuma and in the Colorado River, we know that the waters converge there, but they don't stop there. That when they're running the way they're supposed to, they keep going all the way to the ocean. So I really love to just kind of take that picture in for a moment because... I'm here by the Salt River, which is, you know, coming out of the entire, the mountains that are to the east of me, the Gila River run together to the Colorado River, and I feel like it's kind of a, a metaphorical vision as well for our movement, where we're all in separate places, but the, the waters really run together, uh, you know, here's a, here's a visual picture of that, and then not only do they run together, but they, they release out into the ocean, this vast expanse. Uh, that we really, that we really, I mean, it's unfathomable. It's unfathomable to think of just a river turning into an ocean until you really see it for yourself. Um, so here's a picture of, you know, some of the traditional weavings of the Colorado River people. And uh, from what I understand, previously in times past, um, the rivers would serve as trading routes. And so all of the wonderful things that are, you know, able to be cultivated in the desert could be brought down to the ocean. And the ocean is what would connect us then to the other continents, uh, to the Baja, you know, sea. And um, I am here as a representative today just of the Earth family. I only really feel that I do one thing. I just come, I show up, I like to be myself, and I like to create the environment of freedom and love for the students in the garden. And I know that you all do the same. And you probably have years of expertise, many of you. Uh, you have years of wisdom. And what your, your work is, I know that it's often built on a foundation of faith and trust. Just like running along the rivers with hope that one day you'll reach the ocean that faith and that trust that it's making a difference, it is. Just by showing up, that's always the first step. So I thank everyone for being here today. I thank you guys for welcoming me into your space uh, to just bring energy, bring excitement and enthusiasm because, you know, I'm out here in Phoenix. This is a picture just from yesterday um, out in my school garden with my students. I'm a teacher in the Creighton School District and... Um, I've been able to just experience what it is to be with the students in the garden. And I see this, the school gardens right now as a movement, as a movement, not only in Arizona, as a movement around the world. Um, we have um, a, a network that we have been basically what that is, is just you're gardening, I'm gardening. And when we uplift our connections to each other, I think it uplifts the entire movement, the entire moment for the possibilities of gardening in schools. Um, just like in an ecosystem, nurturing the connections lifts us all. And 
we in Arizona are so unique because we have these two semesters, which, you know, perfect, the, the school calendar perfectly mirrors our planting calendar. And so I, I, I've been able to meet various people who are all following the same train of thought, which basically says Arizona can be this model of what it is to bring gardens into schools and students into the garden for the rest of the country and for the rest of the world. And it, it sometimes it seems like a lot of, you know, pressure to perform or to make sure that, you know, a lot of, you know, important objectives are being met or curriculum is happening and lessons are happening. Um, but it's also a very simple experience of just being there and just showing up. And that is what the work is, because nature is our teacher. And, you know, all of our care, all of our nourishment comes from the earth. So to have an opportunity to give back uh, to become caretakers of the earth, to become healers of the earth. I know the land loves it. I know life loves it. And, and that aspect of just being present as members of our earth family, showing up and just imparting that, it's to me, I see it as a transmission of wisdom. Um, and I know as, as teachers, this represents uh, the nodes of the network there, as, as teachers... Um, we we know that we're making a difference, you know, all the time, but it, it's sometimes it's hard to see right away. Um, but there's there's kind of a, an old story called the Indra net in which it's like the whole universe is a net of jewels. And in every single jewel, the entire universe is represented. And each jewel is also part of the greater net. And I see that as the children and as um as our children get to become in touch with who they are and their place in the world, something happens where they're able to be awakened, they're able to be inspired. And that starts simply by creating the space for them to be allowed to be there. So I have this um, image here, Let's see if I can move myself for a moment, of just kind of a reflection of how we all got here. Um, you know, our present moment our knowledge that we have, our ability to recognize the development of a plant, our ability to recognize uh, the function of the bees and the hummingbirds is wisdom. And it's the earth's wisdom. And it's our ancestors' wisdom. It's our family wisdom. It's a spirit wisdom, spiritual wisdom of life. Our present moment was brought to us by our, I don't know who it was in your case, um, but by people in our lives, our ancestors and our experience in nature, who were able to point these things out to us and develop our eye uh, that we could see, look at, look what happens after the fruit uh, is, is, you know, after the flower is finished flowering and it comes back and it becomes the fruit and the fruit becomes the seed. And this wisdom has brought us from the past to the present. And I know for a fact that it will be and is being transmitted onto the future. We are the bridge. All of you here today are a very important part of this bridge of transmitting wisdom from the past to the future. By creating the space for the students to be there, I believe that we're cultivating hope. I believe that we're cul cultivating hope not only for ourselves and for our students, but I believe that through the stories we share about our students in the garden, we're also creating hope for our larger world, for other people who don't have the opportunity to sit with students and to see the light in their eyes and to see the enthusiasm and the love and the lessons learned. As we share these stories, the people who are doing other work in the world where they may feel down, they may feel cynical, they may feel like it's not worth it anymore. I try to share these stories as much as I can because I can see that it's growing. Just like a little plant in the crack of a sidewalk, it's strong, it's alive, and it's thriving. So thank you again for just being who you are and being present. We're so diverse. I don't know. I wish I could be with all of you. Uh, in person, in order to meet you, in order to know you. But I know that in all of our diversity, we have so much strength to meet the students exactly where they are, to be patient with them, to love them, and then to allow them to be who they're going to be in order to really give the, the future a hope. Um, because we know, we know that we have been eating, we have been cultivating food as human beings 
forever, forever. I love the new research, the new information that is coming out about the Amazon rainforest, about the biodiversity of Australia, uh, of India, of Africa, Asia, this continent, everywhere. Um, has been a place where humans have participated in the ecological web of life. Humans have participated in cultivating plants for medicine, for food, for beauty, for housing, for the very entire society. And we know that every aspect of, of our economy really does start in nature because all resources come from the earth. Even the most plastic technological device was once a part of the earth. And so we recognize that we are nurturing the wild. We're nurturing the experience for children to see that they actually have are in touch with the source of everything else, that they can decide what do they want to eat for dinner and how can we plant and grow the seeds that they want to experience. Agriculture is the basis of all culture. All cultures around the world have food. All cultures of, around the world have some type of variety of flavor, of spices, of traditions that, you know, comes together around the dinner plate, around the breakfast plate around the, you know, outdoor kitchen or around, you know, various ceremonies involving some natural foods, some natural plants. So we're, we're really creating space for not only school gardening, but we're creating space to reimagine culture, to reimagine um, what it means to, to value and to, to have respect for life and the things that really come first and go out and they create all else. So I... Uh, have been so thankful to have just a lot of diversity, just a lot of different perspective brought to the table um, as far as, as gardening goes. And I, I know that it's called school gardening now and kids in the garden now, but there was a time when it was just life. And we were all there together and we were all cultivating together and it was natural for kids to be a part of that. And I'm sure many of you here today did grow up on a farm. We're growing up now in a generation, in a moment in which we still have our elders to share what, what, what it was like to participate in picking berries on their grandparents' farm or growing potatoes or canning jellies and jams for the winter. Um, all of this I honor. It's so valuable. It's so awesome. And it's a practice that precedes everything else. And what I mean by that is in order for the students to be able to have self-determination in the world, in order for the students to be able to have their own possibilities of how to see themselves and how to relate to the many things in our society, they first need to be practicing this culture of caring for the earth. They first must embody the experience of themselves planting a seed, of themselves harvesting lettuce, harvesting salad uh, ingredients, harvesting everything, and just being present and seeing it for themselves. By giving the students this firsthand experience, you're making possible a real shift in their awareness of what the world is, how it works, and what their possibilities are for the future. So I included a little, a few graphics here. Um, one is here the United Nation Declarations of the Rights of Indigenous People. I also have a copy which is available to look at. I don't know about your student populations, but in my student populations, we have a lot of original people of this continent. Whether their nationality is Mexican or tribal or American, um, in, the, in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, there's a lot of thought-provoking um, agreements or proclamations that really allow people to remember our origin, all of us, um, and, and specifically people who have like kept their traditions alive and who are able to access that indigeneity, um, to self-determination, the right to have our transmission of our culture, the right to our, our cultural values, and just, you know, I, I really feel a lot of unity with 
um, this concept, not only because of my ancestry, but because when you go back far enough, all of us have have come from the earth. All of us have come from a relationship with cultivating the earth. Uh, every culture had to. It had to because it had to eat. And I know that now we have a, a whole food system that's been removed from the earth um, in a lot of ways. But that um, that is a very recent phenomenon and it does not seem sustainable. I know that's part of our reason for gathering and pro probably a lot of people's reason for being so passionate about what you do. And so I would encourage you to look at the rights of indigenous peoples. It's very interesting. And again, to just remember that this experience of looking at plants, being with the plants, feeling the energy, feeling the sun, feeling the air, simply knowing that half of our breath is in the tree, that the green leaf produces the oxygen and that we produce the carbon dioxide and that we have an interrelationship and that we're interconnected, this experience will make any other progress possible, likely, enjoyable, powerful. The other uh, image is the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which I was recently introduced to, which is also, I have a copy of it here, Ecosystems and Human Well-Being. And I like this picture of the, the earth as a house, just to remind us kind of like how it's, it's a collective shared home. Um, but I wanted to put the space in the background too, because, you know, it still is in even a larger context. And our experience is, is really not small. It's not insignificant. We have no idea. We have no idea who is going to go on to, to just really carry this into the next generation. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was um, the United Nations brought together scientists from around the world in order to assess the human impact on e ecosystems around the world. And they did it in various ways in various places, but they, they came upon indigenous people in Peru who had a methodology of in-touchness with the wor world, with the earth, that created an aliveness. And it's just, it's a different perspective when you have... Um, an indigenous worldview of the earth family <clears throat> that's different than just being completely removed from nature as we are often, you know, <clears throat> so many students do not have a chance to go outside. I know when I first arrived at my school, there was a small um, salsa garden. And I think that was basically the only thing that was growing. And the students were shocked that you could eat a leaf. And I'm sure you've had this experience too. Students are asked, where does food come from? And they say the store. Um, students are asked, you know, then what? Where was it before that? And they're like, I don't, a truck. Or They don't know, in many cases, the wisdom of the seed. They don't know about the relationship between humans and food and the earth. And <clears throat> as a teacher, it's been always constantly a process of stepping back and stepping back and stepping back and saying, oh, I see, there's a gap here as well, and there's a gap here as well. I didn't know that they didn't know, you know, that food, at, at least in some abstract sense, came from the ground. But um, I have had a shift in perspective of, of seeing not human, you know, I know there's another perspective that sees humans as like an invasion on the earth and that they, they shouldn't be here. But humans are a beautiful, beautiful part of the Earth family. From our creator, uh, to care for our very first job, to care for nature, to care for and be good stewards of the land. So the perspective of, of uh, you know, kind of like, okay, we are the top of the food chain. I don't know how many of you learned that we're the top of the food chain. Um, I think I was taught that we we're at, on the top, but I didn't ever really until I, I more recently as an adult see that we are more like cultivators we're more like caretakers the the web of life is actually more like coming through us in a lot of ways I mean we're only we're only one species among it but we're able to breed these other species we're able to bring out hundred thousand varieties of rice and thousands of varieties of corn and thousands of varieties of wheat not to mention you know animals and not to mention every other species that's through cultivation that's through you know selecting foods that's through a, a wisdom and a relationship with our plants um and so it doesn't say everything is here and we're going to pull it out of the ground just to serve us it says i want to give back to the earth because the earth is caring for us and i was you know I, i've been able i heard my student juan said yesterday 
The plants care for us, so we'll care for the plants. It's a relationship. And this, you can look anywhere. You can look in any society, I'm sure. Look in your own ancestry. Uh, what was that worldview that taught us that we're part of life? Not above it, not removed from it, not better than it, but in gratitude and love that we're part of the life. In India, there's a philosophy called Vasudeva Kutumbakam, an ecological civilization uh, that respected the forest. They say the whole world is within the forest. Uh, within that forest of life, cultivating, uh, discovering, finding belonging, finding the opportunity to realize so much wisdom and philosophy, so much aliveness and so much life. Uh, on this continent, a lot of times there's a phrase where they say, all my relations. All my relations includes the air, includes the sun, it includes the soil, it includes the plants, the animals, the bugs, the trees, the leaves, and of course, human beings. So there's a few images here. You can see the plants, the animals together. Um, and Mitaki Uwasin, we're all related. It says, as the rays of one sun, as the waves of one ocean, as the fruits of one tree, refreshed by the same breeze. So we have our whole earth family. And I think when we respect our earth family, we respect our human family. And I'm just so, I'm so excited that we're at a moment of true diversity. I mean, truly, everyone's background is different. We're coming together with the same love, with the same passions, and we're bringing out something new. We're bringing out a global different view of how to embrace all of these differences, celebrate them, and put our life and love into the soil, into the earth, and see what happens. I know it's going to be great. I love, I love experiencing the students over time grow up, and I know that they're having an experience that actually I didn't have. I was outside in nature as a child, but I did not have a school garden or have an experience planting and growing as a small kid. So that's why I'm so confident that this work that we're doing is transmitting an experience that will be beyond beneficial for the future. I believe this is crucial to survival. But I also have this foundation of faith and trust where it's certain. And all we have to do is show up and enjoy ourselves and have a great attitude. My student yesterday said, I said, hey, what do you think I should say to all the garden teachers? And he said, oh, just tell them to go have a positive attitude. And when they're out in the garden, just go with kids that want to be there, that are going to take care of it and that are going to learn something. I said, OK, I love it. That's a great that's a great message. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I wanted to show one more thing, which is just, I, I recently got reintroduced to this word Cosmovision by a, a cultural group that's here in, in Phoenix called Tona Tierra, which um, you can, you know, look up if you want to. I can try to provide a link. Um, the Cosmovision is, is also, you know, I, it was described to me as basically as, you know, Galileo and scientists in Europe were, were studying the cosmos and studying the solar system and, and learning that, in fact, not everything revolves around the earth, but also we're going around the sun, um, that the relationship or the distance between the earth and the sun is known as one astronomical unit. And that within that astronomical unit is all the culture of the earth, all the culture of the whole world. And this is actually something that was known by the native people and indigenous people of this continent forever. Their entire cosmovision is based on it, is based on relationship, is based on energy, is based on uh, our place within it and the creativity of expression, of expressing that relationship. Um, this picture behind me is um, a picture of Xochimilco, which is a place in Mexico City. My great-grandmother was from near this place. Um, her ancestors were from near this place. And if you can see, um, basically, these are floating islands um, for agriculture. Mexico City used to be a lake, a total lake. But the Mexica people were looking for their homeland. They were going around in, in canoes and boats and canals. Uh, and they, they saw the image of the eagle holding the snake in its talon on a nopal cactus. And they said, this is it. This is going to be our home. And there was a high place where they could start off. But 
it was a lake. So they actually discovered a way to create floating islands using layers of different kinds of soil, rock, manure. Um, they would layer these like these layers of, of, of earth on the lake and then plant certain kinds of trees that would sink their roots down into the lake, into the earth, and then create like stability for that island to be in place. Those are called chinampas. Um, I bring that up because it just it's so much tremendous imagination that's possible when we're able to have this harmonious experience with life. And I understand that the world is a big, big, massive system right now, but the fundamental basis of life is not going to change. Earth, air, water, the sun, our life, our gratitude, God creating us, blessing us, giving us this opportunity to learn to be a part of a family. Um, this is a, also a picture of the Aztec sunstone, which was their way of measuring time according to this Cosmovision. And in 2012, it, it got into the, the next era. It was like a 5,126 year movement of the entire solar system within the galaxy that they were measuring. And I just bring that up because we're right on time. We are right on time. We have our millennium. We have our shift into a new era. There is truly a shift that is happening on this planet and we are part of it. You are part of it. We're connected in this network, even in different places, but keep going. Don't give up. Just be there. Just be there and allow it to happen. I um, think I have just one more. Let's see. Oh, yeah, here's Territorial Integrity of Mother Earth. It is a big, a big, a big and amazing concept that I know it's, it's, it's not always present in, in every, where, every place that we look in the world. But it is present when we're in the garden with the students. So my last story, um, Tona Tierra, a representative of this uh, cultural organization, came to the garden um, that I um, am with at my school last weekend, last Friday, and uh, he brought an activity for, for the students. So the, the picture on the last slide of the sunstone, there's 20 pictures all around the edge, and they represent the 20 days in one of the cycles of how they used to count time for the Nahuatl-speaking people of Mexico um, and of this continent. So he brought a puzzle that was those 20 pieces of the pictures and he had not met the students before, but he said, okay, I brought you a puzzle. Here it is. Put it together. The pieces were nice. They were big. They were wooden. They were carved, um, carved like relief images. So the students all got together and they were all on the ground in our garden. As you'll see in the last picture, uh, our garden has a circle classroom right in the middle. So the students got in there and they're like trying to figure it out. And then I heard one student say, come on, guys, you know what a circle is. And it was really cute and cool to see them all engaged and working together. Um, so then the leader, his name is Tupac. He asked, where does it start? So the students were engaged and they were trying to guess which picture was the first one, but they didn't really know, but they're like this one. And they're like, OK, so we're reflecting on why he chose that one. Then he said, turn the puzzle pieces over. And there were dots and there were lines. And he said, now where does it start? And what it was, was the Nahuatl system for counting, um, counting numbers and it, as it correlated with the days. So the students were able to figure out that the piece that had just one dot on it must be number one. So he basically gave them an opportunity to discover the system of numbering. Um, so they, they had the dot, the two dots, the three dots. Then when you get to five, it's a line. Then a line plus one more dot is six. So the students were able to put together this puzzle and then figure out, you know, now where does it start and flip it over. And he was able to then introduce us to different movements with breath that go with the puzzle, that go with the day signs, I should say, um, to basically introduce themselves to the universe. He brought this experience and I, I was just there and I was, you know, after this finished and he brought us an agave plant and I, I just was there talking to him and I was looking around the garden and I saw two students at filling the bird seed uh, I saw a couple students harvesting cilantro harvesting radishes uh, I saw a few students watering plants a couple other students were filling the water for the birds to eat some boys were transplanting the agave uh, you know putting it in the ground making sure it had had you know enough space and water 
And it was a moment that I'm so thankful for. And I said, wow, this is truly the realization of the garden. Because no one asked me anything. No one said, can I get a shovel, miss? Can I, can I transplant this? Can I water the plants? Can I get the seeds? Can I do this? Can I do that? They were just doing it. They were just doing it. Um, the wisdom was transmitted to them over time. And it didn't start with me. It started with their previous garden teachers. It started with their parents. It started with their food. It started with an attitude of gratitude. Um, but here they are in the garden. You can see this picture of the students. Um, this was not yet, not last Friday, but I really loved to see the garden fold on this particular day where everyone is together in a circle, bringing their various backgrounds, their perspectives, their shared interests, their shared love, their shared fun, their creativity, their life. So my message is simply just to keep doing, keep going, to don't give up. Your confidence will grow. I know it's scary at first. I was afraid of going into the garden with students at first, too. It's unstructured. It's wild. It's outside. There's tools. They need water. But just show up because there's, there's an emergence of life. There is a coming together of all of our experiences right now, and it's transmitting the wisdom from the past to the future. And I'm so excited for everything you're all going to learn this weekend uh, at the Garden Summit. Every single workshop, every single person around you, every single one has so much to offer, so much life. And I just, you know, keep the enthusiasm, keep the love, keep the life, because you just, by being yourself, again, you're just uplifting this entire network without even knowing it. You just talk talking to a student and helping them put their hand on the seed after they plant it and say, I hope you grow. They will never forget. They will never forget where food comes from. So thank you so much again for having me. I just send all my love and encouragement for the entire weekend. Um, anytime you come to Phoenix, you're welcome to reach out to me. You're welcome to come into our garden. And, you know, I mean, I just see this world with all these circles of gardens all around Arizona, all around the country, all around the world. And, you know, right now it's called Kids in the Garden, but it used to be called Life. And it's going to be called Life again, where we're all just naturally in touch in these ways. For the rest of my weekend, um, the National Education Association is working on an environmental science micro-credential. And I'm so excited that we have the micro-credential happening. We have legislation going through the Arizona State Legislature uh, about outdoor learning in school gardens. That's happening in Georgia. It's happening in New Mexico. Um, we have my school district created an entire garden initiative this year, and it's not perfect. It doesn't mean, okay, we're done. I keep, I, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just on it, on it, on it with the district saying more, more, more. Get everybody out there. Go. Be present. Um, you can prepare a lot and do perfect lessons, and that's awesome, much respect and love, but even if you don't, even if you just go be there, and even if you go ask them, go find a leaf, go find a shade of green that you love, go find something that you can smell and share it with somebody else. It makes a difference. So thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Um, I send all of my love, and I hope you have an amazing rest of the weekend. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.